Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Anthony Colantuano. I'm the pr professor and interim chair in art history and archaeology, but also um, have the privilege this uh, year of being the chair of the Arts and Humanities Collegiate Council. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Arts and Humanities College Forum, also known as the Spring Plenary, uh, for spring 2018. So um, this event is organized by the Arhu Collegiate Council, whose members choose a topic of urgent interest for the college. Uh, this year we've chosen a somewhat unusual topic, um, titled Arts and Humanities Solutions for Hate, Violence, and Other Inappropriate Behaviors. We intend to help, our, help you kind of find our position within a much larger set of really national issues, rather than things specific to our life here in the college, but things that tie us you know, to that bigger national scene. And uh, those issues, um, which involve things like hate speech, the insidious effects of bias, uh, the persistent problems of sexual harassment, sexual assault, episodes of anger and violence, uh, even unfortunately murder in the orbit of our campus, have all unfolded uh, all too close to us. Um, uh, freedom, after all, is one thing, but it's responsible exercise often seems to escape us. So in the current climate, uh, convergence of new crises, new social media, and inevitable sociocultural transition may seem to offer some hope for change on that national scene, and maybe also here too. So there's a couple of reasons why I think we ought to address this as an arts and humanities issue specifically. And uh, first, I guess, for those uh, that are involved in the ed educational enterprise in the classroom, you know, of course, um, we as uh, uh, humanists and artists are involved with kind of uh, human activities that um, are products of the human imagination, um, which is susceptible of a lot more change uh, and a lot more uh, variation than those immutable natural laws that they, that they deal with in the natural sciences or mathematics. So for that reason, we see human behavior as kind of contingent on moments of imagination, a genius, uh, perhaps sometimes of the opposite of genius in people's behavior. Uh, and of course, the arts themselves, whether we're art practitioners of art or whether we're studying art as a kind of historical object, you know, um, that often encodes discourse that can either be really positive or sometimes encode really bad things uh, from the cultures that produce them. And so um, we thought that, you know, again, for our educational uh, side that we might want to talk about some of those kind of issues as well. What kinds of things do we address in the classroom? Whom are we talking to? What are their discourses? What do they bring to our classrooms? Someone out there obviously harbors some very negative feelings when we have these incidents of hate and violence uh, um, around our campus. Um, how can we get them to change those attitudes uh, while also preserving our educational role to represent those past cultures? Um, at the same time, I uh, want to mention too that we don't want to limit this as to a discussion of what goes on in our classrooms. We have a, a world of the workplace in the arts and humanities as well. Ours is shaped very differently from, again, from those of the sciences. Uh, for example, we often have very small departments, which makes the power dynamics that much more kind of sometimes uncomfortable, uh, some, with less recourse, less room for escape if uncomfortable situations arise in the workplace. So we need to think a little bit maybe today also about you know, what our humanities workplace is like, how it might be different uh, for people um, in our interactions with staff and the power dynamics among faculty and staff or faculty and students, staff and students. Uh, you know, those are all things that I think are affected by some of the issues that we're talking about here, the attitudes that we bring from our home environment um, and from our education and our past to the university environment. So I'm really hoping that um, our three speakers today are going to shed a lot of light on that. I know they will uh, on, on ways that we can sort of perhaps um, understand these, these bigger issues. And then maybe in discussion afterwards, as they'll sit as a panel, we have a chance to kind of not grill them, but perhaps discuss with them some of the issues um, that they've talked about that might get us thinking in new and different ways about um, our own situations. So um, our three speakers, I'll introduce really briefly um, now. Um, Roger Worthington's um, Chief Diversity Officer and Associate Provost uh, in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion uh, here on campus. Um, Carol Stabile, Professor and Chair, Department of Women's Studies. And Ana Patricia Rodriguez is Associate Professor of Spanish and Portuguese in the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. Uh, each of these um, speakers are experts in their particular area that they'll talk about and uh, have their, 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 um, their finger on the pulse of some of the very issues that we want to talk about today uh, in our uh, session, Arts and Humanities Solutions for Hate, Violence, and Other Inappropriate Behaviors. Before we jump in today, I'd like to uh, ask our dean, uh, Bonnie Thornton Dill, uh, to step up for a moment and say a few words.
I was going to stay down there, but then I realized we were live streaming this, so I probably needed to come up and speak into this microphone. Well, Tony has really said everything that really needs to be said about this, and I don't want to defer for too long. Uh, the panelists, I want to thank you all for coming out and just reiterate that part of our theme, at least around the Dean's Lecture Series this year, has been the theme of courageous conversations with the idea that it, around issues of hate and bias, with the idea that it takes courage to both talk about these things, these issues, and also um, that it takes courage to uh, listen, learn, and grow from the insights of others. And so that's really one of the opportunities we, that the Collegiate Council wanted to provide for the college today is another opportunity to discuss some of these issues, share some ideas. It's been a tough year for us here on campus. It's been a tough year uh, for the nation. And certainly many of the issues that we care deeply about, that we teach about, and that we work with students on have been at the center of these concerns. So I welcome you and I welcome the panel to come forward and uh, take us deeper into a conversation about these issues. Thank you. Great, well thank you. Um, my name is Roger Worthington. I go by he, him, his pronouns. Um, I want to really uh, say thank you to the RHU Collegiate Council for inviting me to take part in the forum today and to speak with you. Um, you know, I've, I've been in this role now for about eight months. And, um, you know, I came to the university about three and a half years ago. Uh, I came to the university from the University of Missouri where I served for a time as chief diversity officer and then returned to my role as a faculty member there before coming here as a department chair in the College of Education. I served in that role for three years and uh, actually chaired the search committee to look for a new chief diversity officer here after Kumail Shorter Gooden, who I've known for many years actually, uh, stepped down uh, in January of last year. And um, as you're all aware, uh, I stepped into this role after the murder of Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III, in part because it just was uh, something that changed the way that we really understood what was going on on our campus at the time. Uh, and so in that context, uh, the search was halted and the provost and the president asked me to step forward to serve in this role. Um, so I've done that for the last eight months and um, I'm here to speak in that role today as chief diversity officer. And, you know, I think about the kinds of issues that we're asked to talk about in the forum today, and I'll keep my comments relatively brief. But um, one of the things that I was asked to reflect upon is to um, identify a place where we are maybe not doing as well as we otherwise should. How are we not fulfilling our mission at the university to deal with of behaviors, the kinds of issues that we have seen uh, on our own campus and really across the country uh, in the last year and a half or so. Um, respecting others, um, defending civil rights and equality, intervening against hate speech and violence uh, in all forms, and to respect the rights of women and others on our campus. Um, so, you know, when I think about those issues and the role of a chief diversity officer and what we need to do as a university, um, my message has consistently been that we need to work together. Um, that oftentimes we are uh, so decentralized as an institution, uh, and rightfully so in many ways, Higher education institutions ought to be decentralized in their decision making, in their 
approach to uh, creating an environment where innovation can take place within each of our collective or individual uh, fields of study, we should be decentralized. But in terms of uh, functioning and uh, working toward uh, equity and diversity and inclusion on our campus, we ought to be uh, more cohesive. We ought to be more integrated. We ought to be more effective at coordinating our efforts uh, to move the campus forward as a unified whole. Um, and I think that that's challenging. That's not easy for university campuses, especially one that really is and has a history like ours of being so decentralized. And so some of that decentralization, honestly, in the study of what I've seen over the last several months is that we have become actually rather fragmented in our approach to this work of equity and diversity and inclusion. Fragmented to the degree that our efforts are not as effective as they ought to be. Our message is not as clear as it should be. Our impact is not as powerful as it could be. And so my intent is to take some really important strides with the help of many other people to try to change that, uh, to, to, try, to try and bring some integration to our efforts. Um, how, how can we do that? How can we do that? Well, one of the challenges I think right now is that you know, when, when we think about the university as a microcosm of the broader society, the deep divisions that exist out there, somewhere out there, wherever out there is, those deep divisions also really do, truly, exist on our campus as well, within our institution. Um, we oftentimes think of, and I have spoken about on our campus, the idea that we have hate groups who want to infiltrate our campus from the outside and bring hateful messages. Um, just today, um, you know, today was supposed to be a uh, awful sort of approach to this, uh, something that started in the UK uh, called, did you hear about this? Punish a Muslim Day? You didn't hear about this? Okay, some folks have been contacting us with concern that um, there was a hate group somewhere publishing a flyer that was intended to uh, encourage hateful acts and violence against Muslims. And that that flyer had been distributed broadly on the internet in a way that uh, had the potential to cross over, you know, continents and to actually have an impact on college campuses on the United States. Well, uh, so far, um, and I just uh, checked in a short while ago with uh, the UMPD, and they have said that so far we have not had any uh, negative incidents uh, on our campus related to it. Um, but those are the kinds of challenges from the outside that we face. Um, but we have to also acknowledge that as a microcosm of the broader society that we have to look at ourselves and understand that white supremacist, anti-Semitic views exist here on our own campus, within our own communities, and we have to face those facts. We have to understand that that's true. Clearly, the murder that took place on our campus occurred from somebody who at one time belonged to our student body. Uh, and we have to face that. That will become a forever part of our historical legacy. We have to 
move forward from that. We have to live forward from that. And um, that, that is a very challenging thing to, to do, especially given the deep divisions that existed on our campus before this murder took place. Um, there, were, there was great animosity and an adversarial nature that occurred on our campus prior to that event in a way that we need to heal those wounds. We need to take steps to engage one another in ways that are healing and are curative and help us to reconcile the deep divisions and the pain that has occurred on our own campus. And we still have yet to do that in a systematic way, in part, I would argue, because we are such a decentralized and highly complex and fragmented campus. Um, so in my work, you know, uh, I, I've tried to initiate some of the um, I've tried to take a number of steps as the Chief Diversity Officer to um, address some of these issues, and there are also ongoing is uh, steps that are being taken outside as well, outside my office as well, um, to address issues of hate and bias, to um, think about the ways that we can hold people to high standards and to engage one another across important differences that is part of our educational mission. Um, you know, I, I want to just point out, you know, when I talk about diversity, when I talk about equity, when I talk about inclusion, you know, when we think about justice uh, in our society and on our campus, um, there's a nice, um, uh, quote that uh, has uh, come across my uh, Facebook um, not too long ago and then, then was also posted on the ODI uh, Facebook page. It says that diversity asks who's in the room. And I look out at you and I can sort of say, okay, who's, who's in the room? Right? And my guess is that there aren't as many students as maybe I might have hoped in the room, right? And um, I can make some judgments just by looking, but equity responds, who's trying to get into the room but can't? And whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? And we know that that is true by data and by history. Um, and we can predict by identity uh, who might be receiving inequitable treatment. So, and then inclusion asks, has everyone's ideas been heard? Has everyone's ideas been heard? It's a little bit of a different phenomenon. It's a little bit of a different understanding of what it is that we're working toward. Can people contribute to the nature of what our collective identity is and what our conversation entails and what our privileges are and our values are that we express. And then finally, justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken seriously because they're not in the majority. So we need to take account of those issues as we move forward and help people to think about how they respond to one another and interact across differences. I'll tell a couple of just very brief anecdote uh, about um, when I was at Missouri and I was the chief diversity officer there, I would oftentimes tell the story that I think is applicable here as well, maybe not quite in exactly the same way, but it's useful to frame it in Missouri because it's such a, a striking example. Um, I thought about diversity at the University of Missouri as, as you know, the, the institution is located in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, anybody familiar with Columbia, Missouri? It's, it's out in the middle of the state. It's called Mid-Missouri. Uh, and it's sort of equidistant between Kansas City and St. Louis, the two major metropolitan areas. And 
When you think about the students who come to Missouri, they're these two metropolitan areas and then a big, vast rural uh, area that makes up the state. And our students came from the entire state and, and elsewhere. Um, but when you bring people from the rural areas to Columbia, Missouri, to the university, um, most often from very homogenous, often predominantly white areas of the state. And those students oftentimes arrived in Columbia, Missouri, uh, thinking that this was the most diverse place they had ever experienced. And they also thought of Columbia, Missouri, a town of about 100,000, college town, as the big city. And then you contrast that with students who came from St. Louis or Kansas City or Chicago or Dallas, where we were often out recruiting. And those students often found Columbia, Missouri to be the least diverse place that they had ever encountered. And obviously, a small town. And so you take those students and you contrast their lived experience before coming to the university and you just put them in a lecture hall, seat them next to each other, put them in the dining halls, make them roommates, and you think about how they might encounter one another across just those differences without really particularly attending to other critical issues of identity and worldview and values. And those students were going to have a hard time. They're going to encounter each other in ways that are so drastically different from their prior experience and worldview that there are going to be frictions, there's going to be tension, there are going to be experiences that are normative to students from certain backgrounds that are not normative to students of other backgrounds. And so our challenge as an educational institution is we think about what it is that we need to do in the classroom or outside of the classroom in co-curricular activities is to help people to systematically interact across differences to do so in ways that is respectful, to do so in ways that helps people to learn and to grow, to facilitate their interactions across differences that will enable them to develop competencies, competencies to interact across differences that will prepare them for the real world that they will encounter outside the university. Not just in the work world, because I don't really believe in this sort of neoliberal idea of us preparing workers. Um, but um, everywhere that they will go, we need to prepare them for interacting across those differences. We have to do that systematically. We cannot do it haphazardly or just bring people here as in the notion of simply diversity in and of itself being sufficient. We have to do it in a way that takes into account equity and takes into account inclusion and takes into account justice so that we are systematically preparing our students and ourselves to do this work that needs to be done. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to encourage folks to ask questions when we are in a panel and um, thank you for your attention. Um, for an event that we're having that, that people might find interesting. It's, it's coming up um, later this month. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk to you today, and I wanted to thank um, Professor Colantuano and the RHU Collegiate Council for inviting me. 
Um, I welcome the opportunity to talk to you about what we might do better um, in institutions of higher education, which means reflecting on what we haven't done so well in the past. Um, so my, my, my presentation is an interesting contrast to, to Roger's because I think that when, in, when confronted with the enormity of the political situation that we're facing right now, I find myself trying to really focus on what I can do and to break things down into small pieces. So um, to give me hope and to make things feel a little bit more manageable. So I'm gonna focus just on one little piece, one aspect of sexual harassment on campus. And I wanna make it clear that this isn't specific to the University of Maryland. Um, this is an issue that we can see from the headlines is, um, you know, is a problem on a lot of different campuses. And that is the issue of sexual relationships between faculty and students. Um, these relationships are, in my experience, at the heart of many problems on university campuses, um, especially harassment and hostile work environments. Um, Faculty-student relationships have also emerged as the focus of the backlash against feminist efforts to address sexual harassment on college campuses. So I think it's really important to have a candid conversation um, about them and about the problems related to them. You'll see some definitions on the screen. Um, in the interest of time, I'll let you read those. Um, so, what do faculty-student sexual relationships have to do with sexual harassment and or hostile work environments? Why shouldn't faculty be able to have sex with their students, undergraduate and graduate alike? Um, here are some of the explanations I've heard over the years from faculty members, and the, the, none of these date back further than 10 years, so don't think it's in the distant past. Um, we can't help who we fall in love with. Um, students are our demographic. Power relations are sexy. To deny the erotics of the classroom, that's a quotation, is puritanical and unreasonable. Students and faculty are adults who should make their own decisions about sexual relationships. Um, faculty spend so much time at work, it's unreasonable to think that they would find sexual partners anywhere else. I hear this frequently in relation to STEM fields. My response is bumble. Um, smart people are turned on by smart people. And that was in an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education just last week. So taken on their own, these sorts of justifications are not without merit. But in the context of higher education, these responses deny all the ways in which faculty, student, sexual relationships reverberate beyond the two people who are having sex. Those who seek to justify faculty-student relationships maintain that individuals have the right to have sex with anyone they want regardless of power relationships or context. Um, indeed, much of the debate about faculty-student sexual relationships revolves around the rights of individuals, um, as one faculty member told me, to, quote, freely associate with their students. In this libertarian perspective, um, students and faculty, as Northwestern professor Laura Kipnis has put it, should be able to have sex with anyone they want to. Attempts to regulate workplace relationships in Kipnis's opinion are paternalistic, puritanical, and reflect paranoia about sexual freedoms. Let me be clear, um, I think it's terrific when people have sex with partners who have enthusiastically consented to it. Um, I'm all for healthy sexual relationships. I also agree that the history of institutional regulations of sexual behaviors is a terrible and oppressive one, particularly for people of color, women, queer people, and other marginalized communities. However, and this is a big however, the libertarian argument overlooks the effect that sexual relations between faculty and students have on our units. Um, faculty members' fundamental purpose is to provide all our students with access to an education free of discrimination and hostility. Sexual relationships between faculty and students they supervise and evaluate undermine our mission and create hostile work environments especially for graduate students. And I don't need to, I don't have time to talk about the dis disproportionate impact on graduate students, although I'm happy to do that in the Q&A. I wanna give you some examples of how these relationships negatively impact our edu educational communities and our workplaces. So my first example. My first job was in a department where for more than 30 years, male faculty members engaged in serial sexual relationships with white female and male graduate students. Since all faculty members in a small department 
um, evaluated the department's graduate students. Um, professors were writing letters of recommendation for students they were sleeping with. They were serving on committees that awarded fellowships to their lovers. They were assigning grades to their lovers and so forth. This created an environment in which standards of evaluation were completely compromised and inherently unfair. As one student put it, do I have to sleep with a professor to get a Mellon Fellowship? My second example, on another campus, an undergraduate was part of a faculty member's lab. She was involved in a sexual relationship with the faculty member who ran the lab. Um, other students in the lab believed, rightly or wrongly, and I don't, I don't think it matters which, um, they thought that the professor's lover was being given preferential treatment. When they complained, the graduate student whistleblower was retaliated against and forced to leave the lab. My third example, on the same campus, a faculty member scheduled a meeting with one of his teaching assistants for the last day of the term at 5 p.m. Um, he refused to tell her what the meeting was about. She was nervous, he was her supervisor. He was a nationally recognized expert in her field, and he was a faculty member she had hoped would supervise her dissertation. So she shows up at his office in that near deserted building, and he pushes a note across the table. On it, he had written, will you go to dinner with me? Startled, deeply uncomfortable, she said no, and she wound up leaving the university. Now, these examples highlight a number of problems with the libertarian position. First of all, who knows whether faculty advances will be seen as welcome? It's one thing to be in a social situation where you have a reasonable expectation that you're approaching people as potential sexual partners. It's very different when you're a student with the expectation that your professor is there to teach you and not proposition you. Um, what happens when these, these advances are unwelcome? What effect does it have on our students? Um, two, the issue of consent in faculty-student sexual relationships is a vexing one. The power differential is massive. The possibilities for coercive behaviors multiple. Can a relationship where one person has supervisory or evaluative power over another truly be consensual? <coughs> Talk to people who've experienced unwelcome sexual advances in the workplace, and you'll get a sense of these complexities. Think about how it feels to be the only woman in a math class where you've had to say no to sexual advances by most of the men in your class. Think about what it's like to have your teacher shut his office door, move close to you, and put his hand on your knee. And when you're put in the position of rejecting a faculty member's advances, what are the implications on your career and on your future? The third point is that the libertarian position doesn't consider the broader impact that I've hinted at before of student-faculty sexual relationships on classrooms and departments as places where we work and learn. Take the faculty member who was involved with the student in his lab. He obviously didn't consider the impact that his relationship would have on other students working in that lab. He cared about his sexual desires as an individual. Professor Kipnis is guilty of this too, in her nostalgia for the good old days when faculty members slept with graduate students in a kind of boozy haze. Leaving aside the problematic issues of consent, these behaviors created toxic, alienating cultures for all those who didn't participate in them, not to mention the students who were casualties of those cultures. That is, even if, and it's another big if, Faculty and students eagerly encounter each other as individuals on an eroticized but even playing field. These relationships affect the entirety of the educational environments in which they take place. So, against the libertarian position, and this is my positive move, um, I'd posit a community-based approach. As professors at research institutions, we're entrusted with teaching our students and educating them. We have great power and influence, and I don't think there's a day go by that goes by when I don't go into my classroom and think about that. Um, our responsibilities entail a specific kind of attitude toward our students, not as potential sexual partners, but as adults we teach and mentor. Our students are here to learn and complete degrees and not to navigate complicated sexual relationships with faculty members. When members of our community regard their students as a dating pool, that undermines our mission and has the potential to create hostile work environments that affect us all. So, what's the solution? Um, while most universities don't ban relationships between faculty members and students, so, yeah. um, most have policies that note that these relationships present potential conflicts of interest. And the UMD policy, is that, yeah, is that it? Yeah, 
it's up there. Um, so if we're serious about preventing sexual harassment in hostile work environments, I'd encourage, and, and this is not unique, I mean, a lot of universities have the, the same basic boilerplate policy. But if we're serious about getting in the way of sexual harassment in hostile work environments, we need to rethink a, a number of things. First of all, we've devoted so many resources, probably still not enough, to researching and thinking about consent when it comes to our undergraduates. But I think we need to do a better job of educating faculty in particular about why sexual relationships with students are such a problem. Maybe faculty also need to have training and consent. Um, we also need to cl excuse me, clarify policy. Because of the impact of these relationships on the workplace, sexual relationships in, one, in which one party maintains a supervisor or evaluative responsibility over the other should be prohibited. What that means is if you're su supervising a student or you have a reasonable expectation that you will be supervising a student, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't have a sexual relationship with them. Um, we need to communicate policies to faculty and graduate students very clearly, explaining why these relationships are prohibited, because I think that there's a lot of, uh, there are many misunderstandings and miscommunications about that. Um, we also need to have um, a sense of what kind of disciplinary action will be taken if the policy is violated. And, and for those who have to adjudicate these cases, this is often the problem, right? We say um, you know, that they're prohibited and that disciplinary action may be taken. Um, but vague policies lead to uneven and unequal implementation. Um, I think the other thing that we need to do, is, honestly, is we need to report and record information about faculty members who violate policy, as well as intervening in departments where these behaviors are routine. Um, and we talk about these as the secrets that everyone knows, right? Departments on college campuses where advisors routinely warn graduate students not to work with faculty members. Um, places where people understand that, that these behaviors are routine and normalized. Um, I think universities also need to stop what's known as passing the trash or allowing faculty to take other jobs rather than facing disciplinary proceedings on their own campus because this is a source of a lot of, um, a lot of serial predation on campuses. Um, so critics say that objections to these relationships are puritanical anti-sex attitudes, evidence of moral panic, and I just want to end by countering that. Um, open communication about relationships that impact our community um, are not puritanical. Um, there's a lot we could learn, for example, from polyamorous communities and in kink communities, um, and the forms of communication that these communities engage in in their efforts to create consenting, healthy sexual relationships. Um, they're by no means perfect, but it seems to me that they have some ideas that are worth our thinking about. Moreover, my preferred policy doesn't ban faculty from dating students, although I could be convinced. Um, an effective policy would very simply state that, again, that you can't be in an intimate relationship with a student you supervise or evaluate, or have a reasonable expectation that you'll supervise or evaluate. Faculty and students also have choices in, in my, my little policy imaginary. They can wait until they're no longer in a supervisory relationship to initiate an intimate relationship, or they can remove themselves from that supervisory relationship. And if they're unwilling to do either, I think there's something fishy going on. And I think our students deserve better than that. Thanks. That's it. Good afternoon, or is it this one? This one? Okay, I'm somewhat short. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Thank you for Professor Colantano and the Collegiate Council for including me in this conversation. So I'm, I'm gonna do something different, I guess, you know, more along the lines I'm gonna be talking as a Central Americanist, one of the few, probably the only one on this campus, and, um, and less about, you know, teaching, which is what I do a lot of talking about. Um, but I'll, I'll preface what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I will be talking about immigration 
especially Central American immigration, which is you know the big boogie um, you know um, shadow out there right now. And um, I, I want to preface that these are issues that are really um, impacting our population right now, our students. So I, I do a lot of community-based uh, teaching and, and research and work. I do a lot of um, community engagement work. Um, I lead students to do work with the community. So these issues that I'm ta talking about today are really relevant, especially to me as a Central American, a Salvadoran immigrant, a 1.5er that came as a child who completely identifies with DACA students, although I'm not a DACA student, obviously. But you know, all these issues that you know, are impacting um, the world. And so, um, as you know, Central American Salvadorans, you know, are the big Latino group in this area. So a lot of our students are of Central American heritage. So um, I'm just going to talk about, you know, that context and also make allusions to um, Dr. Martin Luther King. And um, in my service learning classes, I always preface my classes with a reading with Dr. King, the um, drum um, major instinct. So I'll be citing from that essay or that sermon. Okay, so um, in a 2004, um, in 2004, on a visit to Costa Rica, I found myself in a packed movie theater in San Jose with a friend. We were there to watch the climate thriller The Day After Tomorrow. I don't know if anybody has seen that. It's, it's been a while. Um, about an ap apocalyptic weather event that hits the northern hemisphere and sets off a new planetary ice age. The film stars a young Jake uh, Gyllenhaal and Dennis Quaid as a father and son dyad trying to make it through the storm and back to one another. An allegory of sorts for our times, I have often thought of that film, especially as the United States exits the Paris Climate Agreement, is about to lift restrictions on carbon emissions, and is throwing the world into general chaos these days. But my thoughts also return to that film screening in 2004 for another reason. Midway through the film, in a climatic scene, so to speak, people from the US are seen fleeing south towards Mexico, where climatic effects are less severe. At the border, the climate refugees from El Norte are denied entry into Mexico. In that theater on that day in 2014, the Costa Rican spectators clapped, whistled, and hooted glee gleefully at the sight of US refugees stopped at the border. A cautionary tale of sorts, that film not only warned us about impending natural disaster, but also the turning tide after decades of US interventions, particularly in the Central American Isthmus. What in the United States was often deemed as its manifest destiny, its obligation to fight cold wars in the name of democracy and other exceptional ideals, in Central America at least, all that was played out in US-sponsored interventions, wars, and massacres, uh, lasting, with lasting impact to this day. The clapping at the sight of US refugees at the Mexico border reminded me that when the tables turn, there might be no compassion for the United States. Now, as a Salvadoran immigrant myself and a scholar of Central American history, culture, and literature, I am very familiar with the dominant role the United States has played in the Isthmus and the Americas as a whole. The story of US imperialism is too long to tell, but includes overt covert military intervention, big stick and dollar diplomacies, not so good, good neighbor and other policies, underhanded trade agreements like CAFTA DR, and a cast of thousands of US robber barons, filibusters, School of the Americas, trained advisors, border and custom agents, and others protecting US interests and borders, whose effects linger in the region. The scene at the border in that movie packed a punch, dense with historical meaning and foreboding that I could not soon forget. I use this image to remind us that surely empires do fall, that climate change is real, that destruction is possible, that hate, arrogance, and exceptionalism have lasting impact, and that historical wrongs can boomerang and hit us hard unless we are willing to be critical of our own narratives and flip our scripts. As a Central American and Central Americanist, I cannot but see how the so-called greatness of the United States relies on the larger history with episodes of hate, harm, and destruction across the world. 
Indeed, on the eve of the anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, I am reminded that, on, that in his February 4th, 1968 sermon, The Drum Major Instinct, um, Dr. King um, cites the Gospel of Mark where James and John ask who is to be seated to the right and left of Christ. In other words, they attempt to claim their rightful place. Dr. King uses the apostles, and I quote, desire for recognition, end of quote, to reflect on what he calls the drum major instinct, end of quote. The very drive to be first, to be important, to surpass others, to be exceptional, to be led by ego, in some to be great, as we hear so much of today. To be led by those who seek greatness means that the rest become joiners and consumers of that narrative of greatness, even if it has supremacist overtones. He warns us of a time when, and I quote, the drum major instinct can become destructive if left unharnessed, end of quote. If it, it can drive one to boasting self-absorption self and, I quote, trying to push others down in order to push oneself up, end of quote. And, to quote again, engage in some of the most vicious activities, end of quote, such as hate, discrimination, homophobia, and, his words, snobbish, snobbish, snobbish inclusivism at the root of white supremacy and all the isms that there are. At a macro scale, Dr. King um, goes on to say, and I quote again, that what is wrong in the world today is that nations of the world are engaged in a bitter, colossal contest for, for supremacy, end of quote. He warns us, and I quote again, that if somebody doesn't bring an end to the suicidal thrust that we see in the world today, none of us are going to be around because somebody's going to make the mistake through our senseless blundering of dropping a nuclear bomb someplace, and then another one is going to drop, end of quote. And I feel that's so relevant today. He says, and I quote, because his words are so impactful and wise, Nations are caught up, caught up with the drum major instinct, end of quote. And again, nations in which we live, um, the nation in which we live is the supreme culprit, end of quote. In his sermon, Dr. King called the U.S. to task on nuclear armament, the Vietnam War, and other war crimes, and its reckless course to world and domestic power. I use Dr. King's sermon thus to arrive at the present moment in which a war has been called just this weekend alone on Central American refugees fleeing great violence, social violence, and coming in caravans to the U.S.-Mexico border in search of asylum. Pregnant, undocumented women put on the fast track to deportation. DACA young people denied the promise of belonging and citizenship. And judges who will be ordered to meet a new 700 deportation per year quota system in order to receive a satisfactory performance rating, and to ensure, and I quote, cases are completed in a timely, efficient, and effective manner per the Wall Street Journal. And of course, I just learned that, you know, troops are going to be sent to the border, and, you know, that's pending the construction of the wall, which already exists through great part of um, the U.S.-Mexico border. If Dr. King were here, I think he would tell us that rather than practicing hate on immigrants, we should, and I quote from his sermon, be the first in love, first in moral excellence, first in generosity, end of quote. To reach its greatness, the United States as a whole has to serve and be on the side of justice and truth. So to return where I started, perhaps we could consider Costa Rica a great nation, known for its long history of conservation efforts, its lack of military, since, uh, military forces since 1948, its state-funded social programs in healthcare, education, and pension plans, which actually are under assault, its support of human rights in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and its overall high quality of life, for the most part encapsulated by its social ideology of pura vida, or pure life. When any Costa Rican greets another, the most likely reply is, not well, thank you, but pura vida mae, pure life, good life. It is not surprising, then, that Costa Rica for years has ranked high on the Happy Index Survey, way above the United States. Although, like the United States, the small Central American country shares a high cost of living, 
historical border disputes with his next door neighbor, Nicaragua, and xenophobic tendencies against immigrants and a fear of browning and racialization in a country that considers itself white. Like the United States, Costa Rica is a multiracial society with lots of challenges, but that this past weekend elected its 48th president, Carlos Alvarado Quesada, a novelist and former labor minister who ran on the platform supporting same-sex marriage. With his running mate, Epsi Campbell Barr, an economist, author, intersectional thinker, politician, and co-founder of the Citizens Action Party and the Women's Forum of Central American Integration, the first black female vice president in the Americas. In electing them by a wide margin, Costa Ricans voted down the agenda of the opposing candidate, Fabricio Alvarado, a conservative anti-LGBTQI evangelical pastor and also a TV newscaster. Upon winning, the new president said, and I quote, today the world is watching us and we sent a beautiful democratic message, end of quote. So I think the United States has much to learn from a great country like Costa Rica. Thank you. It's a very difficult one, uh, complex. Um, I almost regret having said what I did. <laughs> uh, only because, you, you know, I, I think that the idea that we prepare students specifically for a workforce, um, you know, makes people into commodities. And we ought not to be doing that, in my view. That's not my value. Um, my value is that we ought to be helping people to actualize their potential in whatever way that they deem appropriate to use their potential to do good in the world. And I hope that that's their value, to do good in the world. Um, and so that's, that's my value about what an educational institution should be. And I, I'm just going to probably stop there just to not overcomplicate the dialogue. Is that okay? Um, Roger, how do we um, engage in this equity, inclusion, and justice processes when today, in contemporary times, so many groups feel excluded and oppressed? I mean, how with the resources we have can we possibly, is there any way to have a sense of priority? Is there any way to, you know, it's sort of like the Olympics, the oppression of but at this moment in time, there are very vulnerable populations who have always been vulnerable, and then there are other populations who are experiencing, as Professor 
bigger set of you know, different types of exclusion. Um, so that was one question. And then I had one for Carol. I did not know, and I cannot believe this, that having a faculty having sexual relations with a student was not a serious offense. I did not know that. After 35 years in the academy, I can't believe this. Um, so, I mean, the question is, what do we know that is being done? And how do we outlaw it? I mean, I heard the libertarian point of view, but at least in the institution. And for Professor Rodriguez, <laughs> um, my question was, the community here, particularly in Prince George's County, is increasingly growing Salvadoran, who are really a disadvantaged population, the Guatemalans also. What is this university doing to uh, address those issues of the population in Prince George's? Um, County. It's not doing a great job with the African Americans. I don't know what it's doing with the Salvadorans. Mm -hmm. So those are my three questions. I guess we'll go in order. Uh, I, I think the question you ask is again, you know, an important one. I think you know when you think about the way that people commonly approach this work. You know, we we call uh, my title is Chief Diversity Officer. Um, there are other institutions that have changed the role and changed the title of the office in ways to um, make sure that we are thinking more broadly about what it is that we do. We're not just bringing people to sit in the seats in our classrooms or to occupy the faculty offices or the staff offices uh, or positions at our institutions we, and, and, then, and then assuming that our work is done. You know, our work has to take account of, you know, issues of equity. Um, and when you think about equity, uh, you know, we have to provide people with access is critical. And in ways that enable them to be successful in our institutions. And to, as, as I was saying just a moment ago in the earlier question, to help them to actualize their potential at the highest possible level in a way that makes them feel effective in the world and to accomplish their personal goals and strivings. And so, you know, those are really, to me, the fundamental uh, goals that an educational institution should have at its core. Uh, there are many ways to go about that and, and our traditions oftentimes mm -hmm. are not closely aligned with doing those things, unfortunately. Um, my work um, tends to move in the direction of difficult dialogues, teaching and learning. I started to allude to that briefly in my comments about how do we systematically in our classrooms help people to interact across differences. And I think that that is a fundamental aspect of what we should be trying to accomplish above and beyond communicating content or delivering knowledge and expertise. All right, I'm gonna to have to stop there because I don't wanna to get too long with it. I just wanted, I wanted to say one thing about the, the issue of suffering. Pierre Bourdieu wrote um, The Misery, it was the, it's the weight of the world in French, it's La Misère de Mou. And, and in it, it's this huge study of housing in France and what he set out to look at are the different ways in which people suffer under the conditions of neoliberalism and the way in which the erosion of resources from the state um, puts people into ever amplified competition with each other over the resources and I find it really helpful to think about it in terms of you know differential forms of suffering where you can listen to people suffering without conflating it or without suggesting that all forms of suffering are, are the same so anyway that's just a total sidebar um, the question about what you do is um, you know I think I think that there the policy has to be clearer Right? The policy has to say that if you're in a, a supervisory or evaluative relationship with the student, those are prohibited, right? And if you are going to engage in that, um, then there will be disciplinary action. I mean, I think faculty also don't know that if they're in a, a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old, 
that's it, that's illegal, right? I mean, so in some of these cases, it you know it is these are criminal offenses. So I think that we have to have clear policies, and then we have to be be willing um, to across the board enforce those policies. I don't care how much people bring in as fundraisers. I don't care how senior they are, right? And we've seen these cases like at the USC Medical School, right, where where the the dean got ousted after lots of terrible behaviors and years and years of terrible behaviors of students, but also hired people who agreed with that, right? Who were who who were accomplices in in reproducing that culture. So two things: clear policy, and the second thing is enforcement. And um, thank you for that question. And you know, to be blunt, and I'm always blunt, um, the university doesn't do near enough right for this particular population and what makes it particularly pernicious is that you know Central American Salvadorans are the largest group in this area Latino groups and you know some of us don't know the difference right because we're all aggregated as Latino or Latinx and so you know you know why I, I kind of made this talk very historical was that you know we need to know the particular histories of the different Latinx groups mm -hmm. because each one, you know, I mean, d brings a different historical and cultural and social mm -hmm. formation that, you know, is important to know in our own local contexts. So, for example, knowing that Central Americans have gone through these, you know, atrocious, you know, mm -hmm. periods of violence, you know, associated with, you know, all sorts of things, right? means that our local population, for example, is, is very traumatized, right? So we need to, you know, consider that. Um, we need to consider that, for example, if our largest Latinx population here at the university is going through particular issues, for example, some of the students may have parents who are on temporary protected status who are about to be deported because temporary protected status was just canceled on March 19th for Salvadorans, they are under a lot of stress, right? And then you have, you know, DACA students on top of that, all that, right? So each one is going through something very particular. And, you know, our outlying communities are Central American. But, you know, going back to your question, it's a, I, I, I'm glad you, 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 ver you verbalized it that way, right? Who's in the room? I'm probably the only Salvadoran Central American in the room, unless there's somebody else here, right? So why, if, if the demographic is so that this area has one of the largest Central American populations, why don't we have more faculty? Why don't we have more students, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those things need to be addressed. And then lastly, I'm always concerned for the workers here on this campus that are in great part of Central American descent, you know, our mm -hmm. housekeepers, our people in facilities, are you know people that work in, in foods and all that right so you know I'm a talker so I'm always talking to everybody right um, housekeepers tell me right that you know their husbands are on TPS they're on you know the track to be deported right and so what does that mean for a mother who's going to remain you know be a single wage earner on this campus right mm -hmm. so I think that you know if, if we were cognizant of all that that you know we would we would develop programs to be able to assist people because, you know, this, the fast track to deportation is looking massive to me. It's looking more massive than, you know, the deportations of 1954 and 1930 of Mexicans. And it's going to happen in our area. And some of us will never notice because these invisible people, they're invisible and they're going to be gone. Just like, you know, in the film, A Day Without a Mexican. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned. Roger, could you talk to us from your perspective on what the arts and humanities can contribute to your mission, your office, and then the flip side, Carol and, and Anna Patricia, what the arts and humanities can do for the campus's diversity and inclusion mission, kind of talk across the institutional barrier, not the institutional <laughs> arrangements that we have, but particularly also to speak from your the disciplinary uh, uh, assets that the arts and humanities bring to the campus, to higher education, to the community, uh, from your perspectives. Well, I, I'm, I'm not a member of the College of Arts and Humanities, yeah, but <laughs> um, you know, I'm a psychologist by training, um, and I, I think I 
you know, start with that lens. Um, I, I'm somebody who um, has focused on diversity issues in higher education throughout my career in ways that I think are broad-based. And um, so I can think of some examples, but it's hard for me to probably articulate the way other folks in the room might have the expertise to articulate uh, more effectively than I, than I could. Um, so, so I want to start with that uh, qualifier, but to say that, you know, in, in my work in the area of difficult dialogues, teaching and learning, one of the things that we did was a uh, faculty development program. We received a grant from the Ford Foundation uh, to do faculty development, and that faculty development included people from, faculty from all across the university. We were shocked, actually quite surprised at the range of disciplines that were represented. Um, it was a competitive program. People applied to get into the program and to become part of a cohort each semester that it was offered. And um, we worked with the theater department, for example, to do interactive theater as one way to enhance the work that we were doing in faculty development. Interactive theater allows people to see a, about a 10-minute sketch that is uh, a scene of conflict in the classroom, essentially, and then to respond, and even then take a step into the scene and uh, perform with the troupe to, so that they can rehearse their work in the classroom around difficult mm -hmm. dialogues, teaching and learning. And there are many innovative ways that the arts and humanities can contribute to the work of, of diversity and inclusion and equity on a college campus. That's one example. And I, I want to say as well, I consider you know, the, the idea that history is so critical to uh, what, what we know and understand about diversity and inclusion in higher education. Um, you know, one of the pieces of work that, that um, we've tried to accomplish this year while I've been Chief Diversity Officer working with Kim Nickerson in Vsauce to develop the African American uh, history walking tour of this campus. Um, the historical legacy of a campus across time of exclusion historically beginning as a whites only, men's only institution is absolutely essential for us to recognize and to understand as we try to evaluate our roots and where we come from and what the policies are that exist that have continued to be inequitable across time and that need to be changed and reinforced uh, toward more inclusive policies. So that, those, those are some answers. Well, I've been here eight months, so the community part is, is hard for me. Um, I live in Hyattsville, and I made a decision to live in Hyattsville, but it feels like it's, it, I mean, it is totally remote from, I go from my home to my job, and there doesn't seem to be much of a connection. Um, so so that, that part has been striking to me. Um, but in terms of the, what the arts and humanities bring to the table, what's interesting, I, I taught my class this morning and so we we're talking a lot about perspective and one of the perspective words they were thinking about was college and what college meant to them and you know I think our students have a much better understanding of what the arts and the humanities mean than in administrators or parents because these are students it's a gen ed class so I have a lot of students from stem fields I have a lot of students from from RHU. Um, but what they told me this morning was that um, we have ways of thinking about perspective in the world that they're hungry for. And they come to our classes because they know that they're going to find those sorts of things in our classes in ways that they don't find them in the STEM fields, for example. So they want to talk about problems around climate. They want to talk about the Me Too movement. Um, they want to talk about ways that they are going to survive and transform STEM fields. And, and so I think they, they, they come to us in large part because they know that they're going to find that here and that we're, we're parts of a bigger whole. Um, I have a kid who's a first year student here um, who's, um, well, he's not sure, English major, math major, right? But, but he reinforces it, you know, every time I talk to him, he reinforces that view that there are things that he's getting from his course on African American literature, right? 
that, that, that really complement and, and help him um, think about being a better mathematician or a better musician or a better whatever the hell he's going to be. Um, so does that, yeah. Um, I think the arts and humanities and storytelling have such an important role to play. You know, we're, we're in, in this world where narratives are being constructed, and you know, I'll stick to my, the theme that I presented on immigrants, mm -hmm. you know, we're bad hombres, right? We're bad people, we're criminals, all those, you know, dominant narratives. So there's got to be some pushback, and that's where, you know, the cultural imaginary, constructing all the other cultural imaginaries that produce alternate, you know, maybe more real, everyday mm -hmm. narratives. So, you know, um, Shimamanda Adichie, right, with her, you know, great, you know, um, um, uh, TED talk about, you know, the, the power of multiple narratives. Mm -hmm. We have to know different narratives so they don't get conflated as we see, right, in Trumpian times where, you know, everybody's a bad hombre, a bad, you know, um, you know, ha uh, women having anchor babies. I mean, those are the dominant narratives that we need to deconstruct. So narrative is, is super important. Storytelling is super important. I'll just give an example. I, I lead a class where we go to a local elementary school and we teach English to moms, my students and I, and we tutor the kids in homework. And so, of course, you know, I, one of my favorite authors is Juno Diaz, and his new book for children just came out. That was, you know, the first one to get it, right? I, Island Born. And it's the story of Lola who, um, who um, came as a very small child, so she has no memories of, you know, her country. And the teacher assigns an activity where um, the children have to draw an image, a picture of their country. So Lola doesn't know, she has no memories. So she goes home and she interviews the superintendent of her building, her mother. By the end, by the next day morning, she comes to school with a book. She is an author, right? Mm -hmm. So what we did with our children, my children at the school is, we read them in the book, my, high school, my college students read them in the book, and we did the, the same exercise. And the kids drew these beautiful pictures, they, they talked to each other, and my college students helped them with the research on their telephones, you know, you know, what is Guatemala, what's the bird of Guatemala, right? So they were able to paint the bird. And all that, right, came out of Junot Diaz's wonderful book. He gives us the template to be able to do these, this kind of activity, right? So I recommend this book, Island Born. It's just a beautiful story and the illustrations are wonderful. can reveal the power dynamics. What I find really interesting is if you talk to students about this, like undergraduates, they're just like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Because I've had conversations in my classes where I'm like, what do you, where do you stand on faculty-student relationships? Ah, you know, they have a hard enough time often figuring out what to call me, right? Call me doctor, call me professor, call me Carol. I mean, the thought that they would have to navigate these really complicated relationships is, 
But it's different with graduate students and faculty, and I think that that's where we really need to have very open conversations about the impact of those relationships on people in graduate programs and the ways in which it can really damage graduate students' careers. Um, you know, because I've seen that happen um, on a number of occasions. People come to work with people, they make advances, um, they rebuff them, there's hostility. And then as I, I gave the example of the department I was in at the University of Pittsburgh, where it was so commonplace that it made the rest of us feel as though everything about our work lives was compromised because we couldn't, it was impossible to be fair in the face of that. And, and to me, um, that's often one of the most difficult things to do if you're in a graduate program is to try to be, you struggle to be fair, you struggle to make sure um, that everyone has access to the same resources and that you're treating people the same way. Um, so. I like that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, the idea that, that, you know, the proximity of graduate students to faculty makes it maybe a little bit more acceptable is actually um, not borne out in the literature. Um, yeah. You know, I, there, for years I taught an ethical and legal issues course in professional psychology where I would cover survey research that um, interviewed uh, doctoral students after, years after they had had a, some sort of sexual contact with a former faculty member of their own. And um, in the vast majority of cases, um, mostly women, uh, they realized even in, in, the, after, in the wake of consen consensual sexual relationships that it was damaging to them. And um, it was d damaging in a number of different ways, both psychologically as well as professionally, mm -hmm. potentially for many of the women. And that, and that the um, professors often used mani manipulative tactics to coerce them into relationships using power in ways that were um, sort of uh, hidden at the time, but more obvious to them later on after the fact. So there's data out there that shows that these kinds of relationships can be damaging, even with those proximal relationships long after the fact. Yeah, I want, I want to add one more thing. I, I think the deal is that, you know, in those relationships, it's, I think it's sometimes you know, there's precedent like of being a manipulator and a manipulator, and I think it goes both ways too, like from student to teacher and teacher to student. And, and it, you know, because in a PhD, uh, candidate student's case versus a PhD person versus a student and maybe trying to get something from a teacher because the teacher's hanging with the student. It ultimately doesn't matter. So I think we need to look past the paradigm of the way the relationship or like for what reason it's happening and just create some simple set of rules and conversations that apply to them. With no no assumptions about what may happen to a lot of different things. So probably have happened that happened. sexual harassment and sexual violence on college campuses, 
um, it's really hard to think that question, right? Like what would, what would restorative justice look like, right, in those contexts? Um, and are we ready to do the work that it would take um, you know, and I think about the murder on campus too, right? How do we do that work in the wake of, of events that are so traumatic for, for you know, the communities that, that we live in? I don't know. I think it's a That's really, job. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You know, I, I, I don't have a good answer to the question. I think that um, we are dealing with something that you know I've referred to and others have referred to as the new new normal in higher education. You know this idea that we have hate groups who really are targeting higher education institutions for recruitment and for getting their messages out because in some ways they see us and and the, you know this is the Anti-Defamation League was on our campus, and they've, you know, uh, a couple of different times, and they've talked about this. They, th these hate groups see us as soft targets, right? And that's a kind of militarized term, um, but it is, um, you know, sort of the the notion is applicable that that um, we somehow um, help them do what they would like to do, and that is recruit new members young, impressionable students who come from some communities that probably um, have, you know, bias deeply embedded in them his historically uh, over time and also, you know, just in terms of, you know, the, the activism that occurs on college campuses pushing up against them when they do show up tends to help get their message publicized more widely and they reach more people by doing that. It's a very, very difficult thing for us to think about how do we, I mean this isn't necessarily new. Um, in 2007 at the University of Missouri we had neo-Nazis come and they marched along the edge of campus. They were dressed in Nazi uniforms. Richard Spencer dresses in a suit. He looks, he looks a lot like I do today. And he tries to communicate in a way that is not, you know, throwing his arm in, in, in the air and, um, you know, uh, you know, goose stepping, uh, you know, across, you know, the campus. It, it is, I mean, what they did at Charlottesville is um, pretty substantially egregious and was, intimidating and threatening and um, you know I was just on that campus and helped them engage in a restorative justice kind of dialogue over the course of two days um, but they're they're healing just like we are and there's lots of healing still to be done healing is a process um, there's no quick solution there's no silver bullet for it um, but I do think that being willing to engage each other across differences, being willing to let go of the animosity and the antipathy that has been part of our past and trying to engage each other as a community and to embrace one another, even across differences, so that we can try to accomplish something that is in the common good. And it, we have to start thinking that way first, and I don't think we've quite done that yet. Um, well, I see it's 5 o'clock. Um, perhaps we should let our speakers off the book for just a particular point. Um, we have to let me go over to the graphic and any additional questions that are moving, but I want to give them a big round of applause for the